has studied a number of thematic works, such as 16th century travelers to Near East, or Neoplatonism and the Paradox of Love in the Renaissance. Emulating Pico della Mirandola, he has extended his research in such different subjects as alchemy and astrology, humanism and utopianism, and uh, Italian, French and English Renaissance love and heroic literature. Our speaker has also published a book entitled The Myth of Sisyphus, Theories of Human Perfectibility and has been a regular participant in the sessions at the, at the RSA annual conferences since 2002. His current interest in, is in Sir Thomas More's humor in his religious polemics with William Tyndale. This is what he proposes to entertain us with now. Thank you. Entertain. That's good. Entertain is Are you ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is going to be entertaining. Uh, yeah, good. Although Thomas More may be seen as the man for all seasons, he is also the man of all paradoxes. It's remarkable that among his family, friends, and enemies, he was considered a man of wit, intelligence, and infinite jest, but whose melancholy view of the human condition caught him in a Sisyphean quest to engage in the tribulations of the world with the aspiration to achieve an angelic stature. It's well known that Moore enjoyed reading old comedies of Aristophanes that gave license to a writer to use invectives, scatology, and slander to expose the follies of people who should behave better. Such comic ridicule is a punitive art that provides pleasure for the author and the audience through its transformation of anger into a joyful release of inhibitions having no relationship to our contemporary theories of political correctness. Cruelty is inherent in all forms of, con of humor that are intended to deny any sympathy for the object of the author's derision. In religious polemics, Martin Luther made attacks on the papacy and Catholic clerics are filled with obscene expressions. Moore enjoys returning the favor in his criticism of Luther and his followers. In the new comedy of Menander, Plautus, and Terence, and the satiric dialogues of Lucian, the function of comedy is to expose the general ugliness of human behavior. However, their humor emphasizes the clever inventions and the superior intellect, moral, and ethical values of the author who transform serious social religious criticism into more affable expressions to be shared with his audience. What made Thomas More laugh? And how did he use humor as a major rhetorical conceit in his religious polemics? He knew that humor generally was treated with suspicion by the early church fathers and the founders of monastic uh, orders who established an anti-laughter discipline within their institutions. Clement of Alexandria, St. Jerome, St. Ambrose, St. Benedict, all argued that jesting made a travesty of the sacred in this wretched world, and laughter was an impediment to the true spiritual understanding of Jesus' passion. However, Despite all the warnings against laughter, Christians laugh, and carnivalesque humor, with its mockery and social inversions, was approved for the medieval church festivals. Divine laughter, God's scornful judgments against human folly, constitute a significant paradox in religious attitudes toward humor. Murray Rawson, in the comic mode in English literature makes the point that humor is built on the asserted superiority of the author in relation to the infirmities of the objects of his expose. Moore believed that by uniting erudition in all branches of sacred and profane knowledge with pity and harmony with Catholic doctrine, he could be able to overcome the perilous follies of hum the human condition. Such an assertion of superiority 
or superior wisdom may appear arrogant. But for the most part, it stands as a corrective model for gullible and ignorant people who deviate from the accepted social norms in their foolish behavior. How seriously Moore took his sense of intellectual superiority is open to question. In Utopia, he seems to be laughing at the prideful utopians as well as himself. However, in his polemic writings, there is no question that he asserts his superiority derived from his role as defender of the church. Moore's humor exposes the affectations, pride, hypocrisy, and self-deceptions and the absurdity of those people whom he considers heretics that make them appropriate targets for laughter. The witty conceits and the obscene, <coughs> the obscenities of his ribald humor also serve as an assurance to all those who laugh that they share the author's moral and intellectual superiority and can reaffirm the truth of their security and their own vision of a proper religious and social order. Humor is also based on incongruity, inherent in the reversal of expectations between the author and his reader based on competing ideologies and the disparity between people's lofty ideals undercut by the imperfections of their practice. Incongruity is, a com is common in anti-clerical humor in which the sacred is made equivocal and in which the revelations of the superior intellect expose insecurities, vulnerabilities, fears, and even the loss of faith. Now it's well known that Lucian was a prominent Greek rhetorician and an entertaining orator and that Moore admired his style, his humor, and his shrewd judgments. Moore enjoyed reading and translating Lucian's dialogues, but what aspect of Lucian's humor became part of Moore's sensibility, and how was it employed in his religious polemics? Lucian united dramatic dialogue with old comedy into a rhetorical art to entertain and, inst and instruct his audiences. His dialogues provided Moore with a model of humor as critical laughter that could be used as an appropriate weapon to expose hypocrites, charlatans, and the affectations of philosophers and religious reformers, impaling them on the comic incongruities within their theories and social practices. Moore and Erasmus appreciated Lucian's humor for its power to alter the author's perception the audience's perceptions of conventional ideas and elevate their critical thinking to a more enlightened perspective. Lucian could rhetorically pulverize his opponents with multiple forms of abuse and righteous indignation in which the vehemence of his attack would convince his audience that his argument was true. He who has laughter on his side has no need of proof. <laughs> in his translation of Asinius, Asinicus, excuse me, Asinicus, Moore appreciated Lu Lucian's uh, irony in the argument between the Cynic philosopher and uh, Licinus regarding their competing lifestyles. Although Lucian allows the Cynic to appear to win the case, the dialogue works to discredit him. The Cynic is rationally correct about the ideal of temperance, but he becomes intemperate in his manner of delivering his argument. Lucian's humor manipulates his audience to sympathize with Lucinus' skepticism rather than follow the logic of the cynic. Moore appreciated Lucian's technique of using self-incriminating irony in which his opponents present their ideas in ways that make them look ridiculous. In Menippus, Lucian criticizes magicians, uh, silly fictions of poets, and contradictions of philosophers. But for Moore, the theme focuses on the ridiculing the absurd speculations of those who distort reality in such a way that even the wisest man can become perplexed. Lucian satirizes people's extreme credulity and ridicules both their passion for lying and their belief in those, and their believing in those lies. Moore applies Lucian's ridicule of liars to those crafty, wicked heretics 
who play upon the ignorance and credulity of simple-minded people and undermine the true Christ, Christian doctrine with false fables about saints or horrendous tales of hell to drive some old woman to tears. Moore saw how easily Lucian turns his tragic vision into a comic view and how reassuring it is to laugh at the absurdities of others rather than suffer the despair of being a victim of it. Lucian's philosopher Demonix Moore, or like, similar to Lucian's uh, philosopher Demonix, Moore could play the part of the old comic poet or the cynic jester to demonstrating his wit. He adopts Lucian's technique of self-dramatization as a comic art that expresses his superiority as the man who laughs, set against the infirmities of the heretics who should be laughed at, as he does in the Responso ad Lutherum. Moore experiences the religious and political situation, or as Moore experiences the religious and political situation in England, as it becomes more catastrophic, he shifts his comic ridicule of Lutheran heretics into a darker metaphysical comedy of the absurd. He elevates his humor from the critical judgments of the superior intellect to the level of divine laughter, simulating God's final judgment and the punishment of those who attack the belief system of Catholicism. Parody is the most versatile form of Lutheran modes of humor, for it includes irony, satire, travesty, and burlesque for serious jesting. In parody, characters are presented in an incongruous manner relative to what the audience expects their proper nature to be, or should be. One example of Lucian's parody is his controversial caricatures of the gods and their earthly rivals, the philosophers, focusing on their potential for incongruity. He demystifies the morally repugnant anthropomorphic behavior of the gods, which he felt suitable objects for laughter. Moore saw the similarities of Lucian humor regarding pagan gods in Tertullian's Apology and on the Spectacular, Clement of Alexandria's Exhortations to the Greeks, Arnobius's Adverse Gentis, Lactanius's Institutes, and Augustine's The City of God, all designed to prove the superiority of Christianity over pagan religions. Lucian also expresses sarcastic opinions about the early Christians in Pergrinus and Alexander, but his criticism was directed against Pergrinus the cynic and Alexander the false prophet, who corrupted many of the tenets of St. Paul's epistles and the teachings of St. Peter and distorted early Christian practices. <laughs> Lucian represents Christians as gullible people, easily played upon by scoundrels like uh, Peregrinus. Lucian calls Peregrinus a charlatan and a hypocrite with auricular pretensions for the sake of notoriety. Moore could easily identify Peregrinus with Luther as the schismatic monk who corrupted the, the, the significance of Jesus' teachings for his self-aggrandizement and whose followers or those who follow him as ignorant and gullible fools. A more complex feature of Moore's humor is his parody of scholastic dialectics and logical argumentation, which he transforms into a rhetorical strategy to analyze the minutia of Lutheran doctrines and reveal their weaknesses. Moore criticized scholastic Cynthia for their stupidity and distorted logic and syllogisms that were capable of perverting the judgment of even sound minds. Theology was degraded into quibbles and questions, degrading, church, degrading the church fathers, Jerome, Ambrose, Augustine, who had resolved many of their propositions long ago. Moore transforms scholastic logic into a humor, humorous rhetorical art in his attack on heresy. Most of the divisive, uh, derisive terms that he uses against the scholastics are similar to those which he had used against Luther and his followers. In his letter to Martin Dorf, he equates Lutherans with the, the Louvain, Louvain scholastic theologians who had attacked Erasmus. They have concocted about God some problem so ridiculous that you would think they were joking 
and some statements so blasphemous you would think they were jeering, that you seem that they seem to be double dealers joying, jo joking, defending the faith while seriously attacking it. In his dialogue concerning heresies and the confutation against Tyndall's answered, he carefully arranges his material as a parody of scholastic sentence. He juxtaposes the serious issues of Catholic doctrine with a trivial criticism of Lutheran propositions in repetitive, anecdotal, and exaggerated combinations. He then overwhelms their baffling logic with his own rhetorical inventions and authoritative citations from scripture, the early church fathers, and Catholic doctrine. More continually appeals to his good Christian reader to appreciate his superior intellect and enjoy his scholastic rhetorical performance. In response to Luther, Moore was cast in the role of defender of King Henry VIII, di sorry, King Henry VIII's dignity against Luther's uh, derisive criticism in the Contra Henricium. Through the persona of Barvelis and later on others, Moore hides himself uh, or disguises himself. He enjoys that. He enjoys using his superior wit, his Lucian satire, and the comic conventions of old and new comedy to attack Martin Luther. He joyfully calls Luther the monk that married a nun, a refrain that he uses throughout all of his polemic writings, as well as a boorish friar, a foolish heretic. He makes puns on Luther's name, calling him a ludificator, one who plays dangerous games, and a ludo, or ludus, a mere player or jester who is the object of perpetual derision. Thank you. He ridicules Luther and his followers as stupid and ignorant, clowns in the service of Satan. He exposes the aff affectations, the vanity, the hypocrisy of his ludic Luther, who conceals his vices under the appearance of virtue. He, noticed that Luther, he notes that Luther's mockery of the Catholic Church can be answered by equally vitriolic scatology, albeit in, used in the name of God and the King. Moore's humor supplements his serious doctrinal arguments, and he believes that laughter is the appropriate response to Lutheran doctrines with its joyful affirmation of the tr that the truth, the true Church, the true doctrines will win out in the end. In his view, Luther had merely recycled the long-standing anti-clerical complaints against the immorality of the popes, clerics, monks, and friars, and he believed that Luther's thesis of justification by faith alone was merely a license for greater immoral behavior to personal damnation, or leading to personal damnation, religious schism, and social disorder. Now, Moore was aware of the lascivious behavior of the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI, the Rivera Pope Julian II, the Medici Popes Leo X and Clement II. Nonetheless, he cites <laughs> Jesus' investiture of Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Moore glosses this text by saying that because of the steadfastness of Peter's faith, Christ made him the head and primate of his church as a rock standing in his own place. It's ironic that Moore omits that in the Gospel, Peter had little faith on the Sea of Galilee, and it was Jesus who identified him before his trial as the one who will defy, deny him three times before the cock crows. However, in texts added to the Gospel, Peter emerges as the exemplar of faith and the cornerstone of Roman Catholicism figuratively and literally as the martyred bishop of Rome. For more, the papacy is not dependent on relative human virtue, the relative human virtues of the men who hold the office, but on the virtue of the office itself as divinely ordained. More could endure the periodic headache of an errant pope, but the inviolable body of the church and its councils must be preserved. Whereas Jesus preached, loved your enemies, 
and bless them that curse you and do to them that hate you. And even for those who sent him to the cross, he offers prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. More is much less forgiving. <laughs> he offers the dire punishment of ridicule for Luther and his followers precisely because he believes that they do know what they are doing. In the supplication of souls, Moore makes a wholesale attack on Simon Fish and his pamphlet, The Supplication of Beggars. Of beggars. Moore ridicules three main themes in Fish's treatise, that England, England's chronic misery was due to the greed of corrupt clergy, uh, that the king was powerless in a kingdom because of the wrath of the strength of the clergy, and that the doctrines concerning purgatory were superficial inventions of the church not based on scripture. He parodies Fish's anti-clerical arguments, reconfiguring them as absurd absurdions, and then joyfully exposes Fish's ignorance of scripture, marshalling his heavenly host of authorities, witnesses, St. Jerome, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, Pope Gregory the Great, John Chrysostom, uh, St. Basil, St. Cyprian, St. Bernard, St. Thomas Aquinas. You get tired. <laughs> the point of Moore's humor is to discredit Fish as a person and thereby de delegitimize the credibility of his anti-clerical treatise. He claims that Fish's wicked book is a venomous poison of pernicious persuasion leading to air. He has a magnificent ear for alliteration. Mm -hmm. I love yep, that, exactly. pernicious po uh, persuasion. Uh, and labels Fish's eloquence as mad ranting and delirious delusions filled with weak arguments capable of proving that every ass has eight ears. He cites the adage that evil books are written by evil men and declares that Fish is a seditious person and a wretched writer, a shameless liar, a malicious fool, and repeatedly makes puns on Fish's name as one who descends into the deep bottomless ocean of evil. No, obviously. <laughs> Moore enjoys exposing Fish's inaccurate statistics, exaggerating clerical wealth. He makes fun of Fish's accusation that the clerics were the sole cause of sickness and pain and poverty as malicious nonsense, as if the clerics made men blind, lame, poor. Moore declares, how could one be so stupid as to totalize the clergy as evil or reform them by turning them out of their foundations and humiliated and destitute and forcing them into marriages. And here we hear echoes of his mockery of Luther as the monk who married a nun and thereby broke their vows. For in all honesty, this matter of monk marriages is so merry and so mad that it can make someone laugh who lies in fire. Even the demons in hell laugh at Luther's folly. And the faithful Christians must think that he is some mad, merry jester. In Lucian fashion, Moore appeals to Henry's pride, flattering him. Who could possibly think that a king as powerful and pious as Henry VIII could be made weak but due to clerical influence? He transforms Fish's anti-clericalism into a squalid expression of atheistic nonsense and treason for which derision and laughter are the only appropriate responses. Now, how does one treat purgatory humorously? <laughs> Moore has adopted the persona of a lawyer defending souls who are grateful to be in purgatory as a manifestation of divine justice. As a lawyer, Moore calls his witnesses from the Hebrew Bible, from the early church fathers, from Neoplatonic philosophers to testify on behalf of his tripart spiritual universe of heaven, purgatory, and hell. He enjoyed asserting the superiority of the one who laughs against Fish's foolish imagination and reformed ideology. We have intelligence against ignorance, the divine spirit of God against the inventions of the devil, and true faith against heresies that enables him to serve and to assert his own joyful reassurance of the multiple dimensions of God's mercy. 
The most elaborate religious polemics of Moore produced between 1529 and 1533 were his dialogues concerning heresies <coughs> that prompted William Tyndall's answer to Thomas Moore's dialogue and then Moore's very lengthy confutation of Tyndall answered. In the dialogue concerning heresies, Moore uses the Lucian method of comic dialogue between Catholic and Lutheran doctrines in such a way that the former will appeal to the rationality and righteousness of his audience and the latter distorted view of ecclesiastical abuses will condemn itself as exaggerations of human perversity. His harsh invectives serve as verbal mirrors to reflect Luther as the apostate, the open incestuous lecher, a play lime of a devil, and the manifest messenger of hell who provokes men to wrong opinions of God and gives them license to sin resulting in wretchedness. Moore satirizes the demented heretic as ignorant, blind, trickster who tinkers with religious doctrine far above their intelligence. He reviews the Lutheran complaint about Catholic clerical abuse and corruption, but trivializes the lame priest riding on a lame horse and the false virgin receiving a false communion wafer. Moore asserts it were a pity but that an evil priest were punished. But yet it is much pity that we take such wretched pleasure in the hearing of their sin and in the sight of their shame. Good it is for them to look upon their faults, but for us it were better to look less to theirs and more to our own. In Moore's humorous inversion, one should pity the Catholic priest for his failing but one must scorn the Lutheran who criticizes those faults for failing to see his own follies. Satiric humor must provoke critical self-reflection. To laugh at the ridiculousness of others, one must be able to laugh at oneself, for the one who laughs experiences the corrective power of the satire, but the one who is unable to laugh is consigned to the ever dissonant domain of the ridiculous. Moore's language imitates what he considered the foulness of those doctrines, as if his verbal expression revealed the deep meaning of Luther's ideas. Human imperfections began with the fall, but could be ameliorated temporally and spiritually by conformity to Catholic doctrine. However, the frailty of human nature is such that men's endeavors seldom constantly stand any while together with good works often spotted and bespread with sin. Although aware of his own spiritual limitations, Moore stylizes the rhetorical fire of his invectives into a kind of divine judgment in which his verbal ridicule takes on the semblance of that terrible, fiery execution that awaits the heretic at the stake in this world as well as the demonic wrath of hellfire in the next. In the confutation of Tyndall answered, Moore again employs Lucian dialogue and scholastic parody as the primary elements of humor in his assault on William Tyndall, his translation of the Bible, an exaggerated version of his Lutheran interpretations of scripture and religious practice, all set against Moore's critical responses. Now both Moore and Tyndall were intelligent, well-educated scholars in Latin and Greek languages, philosophy and literature, Tyndall did have an advantage with Hebrew proficiency. Both used the comic conventions of old comedy and the rhetorical irony of Lucian's dialogue to denigrate the other's claim to superior wisdom and to show the comic incongruities within the other's doctrinal opinions. However, humor based on authorial superiority and incongruity runs the risk of becoming ambiguous when the author's argument becomes obfuscated with demonstrations of his logical rigor. The humor of cognitive incongruity also risks clashing with the audience's common sense understanding of important doctrinal issues. The audience may respond with laughter, but who and what are they laughing with or at becomes confusing. Mm -hmm. 
St. John wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But in what language? <laughs> Tyndall argued that the general English population could not read Latin or understand the Bible on which their religion was based, and thus their faith was dependent on what the priest said and what is true, and the person could only be, could be an ignorant spokesman for God compared to the truth the people could know directly from the text. Very logocentric. Moore knew that biblical language was equivocal and could appear perplexing to biblical scholars and most assuredly to ignorant laymen. Jesus taught sacred matters through parables containing seeds of truth rendered in terms that some will understand and others will not. For Moore, the Latin Vulgate was holy. The Greek Septuagint was its precursor, and he considered both languages in Christological terms to be sacred. He develops this idea further. Translation is both a transformation and a reinterpretation of the original text authorized by the translator. By substituting English for the precision of Latin, the Holy Word lost its semblance of a divine utterance and thereby opened the text to heretical interpretation. That would lead to a breakdown of religious and secular authority. Moore objects to Tyndall's linguistic innovations that resulted in outlandish English. Ciceronian rhetoric called for eloquence and Moore mocked the literalism of Tyndall's plain style, which in its simplicity, he argued, distorted the complex, comprehensive, and evocative meaning of the biblical text. Now Moore begins his confutation of Tyndall with his familiar comic invectives, denigrating Tyndall as the heretic, calling him a beast, discharging foam of blasphemies out of his brutish mouth. God, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> a deceiver, a hypocrite, and one who is puffed up with the poisonous pride of malice and envy, echoing his attack on Luther in the Responso, in which he defended Henry VIII, and his attack on Simon Fish, in which he defended the clergy and the doctrine of purgatory. In the confutation, Moore is defending himself, and he employs all forms, <clears throat> and he applies all forms of humor, comic invectives, scholastic parody, and critical laughter in his attack on Tyndall's answer, not as intemperate ravings, but as an elaborate demonstration of his intelligence and the, transver and the transcendent virtues of Catholic doctrine and practice. Moore enjoys in finding errors in Tyndall's biblical translation and Lutheran in, uh, exegesis. However, Moore seems to have forgotten the caveat in Ecclesiastes 7.16. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why should thou destroy thyself? With all his comic subversions, Moore runs the risk of shifting his reader's experience from himself, as the one who laughs, to Tyndall, who was the one being laughed at. In Rhetorum Preceptor, Luther, uh, Luc Lucian satirized the charlatan sophist ridiculed for quibbling over the ambiguities of correct language. Lucian mocks the sophist by disparaging his parentage, morals, veracity, and lascivious behavior in the process of exposing his verbal falsehoods. But the business of linguistic hair splitting over words that are equivocal, having both literal and figurative meanings, and are not necessarily incorrect, or are not necessarily mistakes, mistakes, leave more open to the charge that his own linguistic suppositions are incorrect and thereby compromise his claim to superiority. His critical humor becomes increasingly belabored and repetitive, and he falls into the role of that comic rhetorician who must justify his humor and explain his own jokes, merry tales and intellectual digressions to an audience whom he perceives is failing to appreciate his critical point of view. 
Moore's, Moore, Moore's assertion that he was the master of comic modes, I am an intellectual, knowledgeable, attractive authority, and you can trust my judgments and enjoy my humor, becomes more paradoxical. If Moore's legacy was based solely on his religious polemics, one might be tempted to assume that his life ended in despair at seeing uh, Lutheran polity spreading in England. However, from the very beginning of his career as a religious polemist, Moore took great satisfaction in his role as the defender of his faith, even more than Henry did when he got that title from the Pope. And he used all of the comic modes of humor to serve as a bulwark against despair, against a sense that he was losing. He could still laugh. He had faith in the superior wisdom of his intellect and, superior and spiritual commitment to Catholic principles. And by following the dictates of his conscience, he maintained that divine laughter and scorn of derision that he had used to punish the follies of heresy. His laughter emulates the merriment of heaven, a term he, repeated, he repeats over and over again in his later Tower works as the great reward for those who keep the true faith. Even on the scaffold, Thomas Moore smiles. Thank you. <laughs>